Welcome back to the Corporate Finance Academy. Today we're going to go through how to revenue forecast. How to revenue forecast. We are going to go through the different methods of revenue forecast today. You can see them listed here. We're going to get into each one as we go. Uh, our, our agenda for today is I have a quick story. If you don't want to hear my story, you can skip to the forecasting methods, feel free, uh, and then I'll wrap things up. But first, a quick story. So this was kind of a funny story that happened in my career. So I was asked, this was 10 plus years ago, I was a divisional FP&A leader, and myself and the VP of the commercial team got asked by our division president, who he's now actually the CEO of a, a, a public company, but he wanted us to put together a predictive, multivariate forecasting tool that would predict our volume and sales. So you'll learn, if you, if you follow along, you'll see what a multivariable forecast is. But this was a big project. We, got, we had to gather all this data, we had to clean it. We're talking daily sales data by customer, by product type, category, by part, SKU, just getting all the data and cleaning it took about a month. Uh, and we had to teach them what all the data meant because they needed to understand it. And you know, if, if you start with bad data, you won't have a good model. So then the, the data, the, the process shifted to this data science team. So we were lucky. We had a brilliant data scientist. I think he had two different PhDs from top tier universities. He had a team that worked for him. They had a ton of computing power. So they ran these simulations which would test all these linkages in correlation between our data, paid third-party data we got from industry sources in 250 different public indices. So 10-year T-bill, Fed funds rate, oil prices, mortgage rates, housing starts, you name it. And they tested these things at all these different lags. So you know, does a, a change in the 10-year T-bill today, does that impact our customers on a one week lag, two weeks? So they would test all this, find the correlations, we iterated, we worked for I think three months in total and finally got to the point where we took it to the leadership team. We gave them the background. And this president said, wow, that's a lot of great work. This makes a ton of sense. Thank you for all the time, but your number's too low. So maybe we need another model. And, you know, he was half joking, of course, but we were still mortified. Uh, we kind of knew as we were getting into it that the number wasn't going to be as high as they wanted. And, you know, his job is to push us hard, push the business harder and increase business results. But our target still got set higher than what the model said. So I just think it's a funny example of what leadership will do, even if you have a great forecast. But that said, Forecasting can be important. We have another video which talks about how important it is and why, so feel free to check that out. Today, we're gonna to go through the different forecasting methods. So you'll, you'll learn that it's not a one size fits all. Different models can apply to different businesses, but we're gonna get through what these are and some of the pros and cons of each. Historical forecasting or trending, a trend forecast. So this uses historical revenue to forecast what your future revenue will look like and more importantly, probably volumes. It's going to have some assumptions built into it. Something like, what's your history plus growth? So we did a million units last year, we're expecting to grow 3%, so a million plus 3%. It may also be more of a straight linear regression, tr straight trend lines. Most likely this is gonna be used in combination with another model, but more on that later. But this is, think about it, if, if you sold 2 million three years ago, then four, then six, then eight, you might say, we're gonna have 10 million next year, right? That's a super simple example of what that trending might look like. So pros, this is probably the easiest process to establish, especially if you're really doing a, a true, simple historical forecast or trend. In a stable environment, this can actually have a pretty good cost benefit ratio in terms of how much effort and energy and time it takes to do it and the accuracy and benefit you get from it. And it's fairly easy to understand. The variance analysis that goes along with it is straightforward. You'll know if something deviates. The cons, it does not take into account known items or customer intel. So if you just did a plain historical trending without talking to your sales guy and he knows that there's a massive order coming in or a customer that you lost 
it's not going to take that into account. It puts a lot of weight on assumptions if you're using them. So like growth rates, how do you know you're going to grow 5%? What's your intel to tell you that? You're putting a lot of weight on that. Um, you know, my two cents here is that this has merit, but not by itself. And you'll see later kind of one of the more frequent methods I've used in the past, uh, use it in combination with something else. So it can be useful with limited time and resources, and maybe if forecasting isn't that important to your business. Um, but often, like I said, use it with another method. So bottoms up or input based forecast utilizes inputs from sales or the commercial team or customer team, marketing team, whatever your, however your business is set up. It's gonna take inputs from them and then it's gonna consolidate into a forecast. It's fairly simple, right? You have a template, people update it, you aggregate it, and there you go, you have a sales forecast. The pros on this is it's using intelligence from the people who are closest to the customer, your sales team. If it's done well, it can align on a customer or product basis if you have good information. Um, the cons is customer agendas. So a customer may say that they need more than they actually do just because they want to make sure it's available. So if your sales guys go into somebody and they're saying, oh, I want, I need 10,000 gallons of paint. They might only need eight, but they want to make sure you have all of their stuff, right? So you've got agendas that customers have, and more importantly, you probably have sales bias. So you have your sales team, who some people might want to beat their forecast, some people are overly pessimistic or optimistic. You just have this big human element that that bubbles up here. Uh, one pro that's actually not on this list, which is in a business that's heavily customized, this can work well, and we'll get to that. Um, the other thing is, you're aggregating these inputs. If you don't have a CRM or some tool, it can be pretty manual. You can have errors. Um, it can take a fair bit of time. You also are chasing salespeople to make sure they actually submit. You don't know if they've up, truly updated. So there could be work for the FP&A team here. So you know, my takeaway here is that this shouldn't really be used unchecked. Or you don't want to have a true, true bottoms up only forecast. Unless, of course, you have something that's highly customized. If everybody that's buying from you is buying some highly customized thing, this actually can work quite well, as long as you have a good relationship with your sales team and you're getting the right level of data. So then you get to the world of data analytics and data science is multivariable or multiple variable analysis, a var variable forecast. So these are where you're really kind of developing an algorithm or predictive analytics. So you have some sort of sophisticated forecasting tool, which is taking different inputs into a model and generating a forecast. And it's usually a forecast that has confidence bands as well, high and low confidence bands. And these inputs, it, it truly depends on your business and a ton of other things, but they can be wide ranging from your own historical data, customer info, company info, index base like CPI, T-bill and, and much more. Usually this is going to require software. You certainly could build these type of things in Excel, but a lot of these will be done in R or other Python or other more sophisticated uh, modeling software. Now, if you get into the pros, one is this is sophisticated and it can very, uh, very likely be the most accurate. These multiple variables can be very, very good at predict predicting future as long as things are stable. Typically, these limit human bias and discretionary inputs. It's based on data. It's typically done at a granular level. So because it's in a tool, you can kind of decide which level. You might get all the way down to the skew level. And it can preventatively point out anomalies to drive action. If, they, if it sees something is trying to generate the forecast, it, you can have these triggers that will tell you, hey, this is off from what we typically would see. On the con side of thing, this is very time intensive and it requires a skill set that a lot of companies don't actually have. So you either have to outsource it or you have to hire somebody specifically for this. Maintenance updates, changes, these are, this is something that does not go away and it's, and it's, it can take a lot of work, right? The world changes. If you think about what these, all, all models would have had to be reworked, but when you have something as sophisticated as this and you have something like COVID-19 happen, 
And for some companies, their demand was crushed and for some it went up, but it was a massive change. And you have to rework all of that. You have to decide all the correlations and triggers and um, things that were built into it now have changed and you had to rework that. And when something takes this long to put together, it's not easy to just pivot as quickly sometimes. You also need, in forecasting, buy-in is important. You, know, you want the sales team to be bought into the number that they're going out and chasing. And if they're not, then sales will do things like say, that's not my number, that's finances number, that's FP&A's number, or something like that. And you want people to be rallying around a number that they're trying to achieve. And it can also take away the ability to explain the why, right? These things can be complicated enough that people don't know exactly how the forecast is put together. So if you say, hey, you, you missed for this company, right? You didn't sell as many of these cars or you didn't sell as many things to this customer. Why? Well, like, you're not sure, right? You didn't, you didn't come up with a forecast in, in a bottoms up way or a, a trended way. So it can be really good. It can be very costly. You have to actively manage it. It's resource dependent. Um, and again, this really comes down to a cost benefit analysis. How much value does your company get from an accurate forecast? And can that justify putting the money into creating something more advanced? Next I have on here is a combination and I've got a little bit of a spoiler alert. This is something I have actually used quite often. The only reason I didn't have it first on the list here was because I wanted to cover some of these other options before we got into this. Um, but when you don't have the resources to, to create something very advanced, you, you want to kind of put together a few things. So here, this is where you're using historicals and you're using some inputs. So a little bit of trending and a little bit of a bottoms up. So what this does is it combines historical data, you're going to adjust for one-offs, thing you know about, things that happened in the past that weren't that we're throwing off your trending, and you're gonna get some inputs from, from, from customer intelligence and from your sales team. Um, so it's a little bit of a melting pot. You wanna combine what works for your business. And the big thing here is FP&A is really gonna to need to develop a process to do this. So it's gonna look something like, you gotta pull data, you have to clean that data up, because likely what you're pulling from your systems isn't perfect. You're going to create some sort of template basically with here's what you think the, the forecast would be based on a few factors and you're going to send it out to the sales team. They're then going to fill this out. They're going to, you're going to collect all the inputs. You're going to aggregate it, probably have a little back and forth with the sales team where you have questions and then you'll finalize it. All right. So there is a little bit of work that goes into this process. The pros here is that it does capture both trends and customer intelligence. And it's done in a fairly time and cost effective manner if you have a good process. It's kind of a poor, poor person's multivariable analysis. I don't know if that's politically correct, but it's got more benefit for much less. It's got slightly less benefit, but for, for much less cost, right? And you're probably going to do this in Excel so you don't have to necessarily go purchase software or be trained on software. And your core team is involved, right? The, the FP&A team's involved, the sales team's involved, and if you do it well, you have buy-in and people are working towards something. And you should be able to explain variances, right? You've come up with this, you've made some assumptions, you've gotten some intel, so if you miss, you, if you miss your number over or under, you can explain why. Cons, it definitely lacks some sophistication, depending on how deep you go. And again, you could, you could make this fairly sophisticated. Um, and it's more discretionary than a multiple variable analysis. You're gonna have some back and forth with the sales team, right? You might not always agree. You might have a little bit of, um, let's say, strong conversations with them, uh, but, it, but you also get a chance to partner with them. Um, and it can get complicated. Again, as you get more sophisticated with these, you, the deeper you go, the more detailed level you get to, the more complicated it could get. And it has it requires maintenance, not as much as a, a more sophisticated multivariable, um, but it does require maintenance and updates and you have to continue to try to get better. And you can have manual errors, right? You're collecting inputs, you're distributing templates, you're doing some, cleaning some data, certainly could have some errors there. 
But overall, I think this kind of strikes a balance between you know being costly and sophisticated uh, and basic, right? So if you have a good process, you can be just advanced enough that it gives you what you need without without spending a ton of money. Probability, pipeline, backlog conversion. So this would be, let's just do a really simple example. Let's say it's your first month ever in business. So you don't have any completed orders or anything. You have three opportunities. One, they're all for $100. And the sales team places the first one at 100% chance, the second one at 50% chance, and the third one at 25% chance. You effectively create a weighted average uh, to assume what your forecast is gonna be. So in this instance, the first 100 would be worth 100. The second 100 would be worth 50. The third would be worth 25. You add those up, it would say your forecast is $175. That's how this works in a very simplified way. I've also got backlog in here, which backlog, some businesses, let's say you have a business that builds fire trucks. They're all kind of custom. It takes you a long time to build them. And you build, you think you can build 10 in the month. You may have those orders months in advance, maybe even a year in advance. So when you do your forecast, you're really just looking at your backlog and saying, how much of this can I convert? So in doing this, using a CRM makes it much easier. Something like Salesforce, where all the sales team is tracking probabilities, pipelines, actual orders. Otherwise, it could be a little tricky to just create it from scratch. Uh, again, I have backlog lumped in here. The pros on these is if a process exists regularly, it can be very quick to update. If you have good data history, you have a good CRM that you use, and the sales team's active in there and updating it regularly, it can be pretty accurate too, depending on your business model. And then, you know, if it's backlog based, it's really just about your execution. If you have enough orders and you just go out there and say, I need to fulfill 10 orders, it's up to you whether you do it or not. So it's nice to have the forecast in your control versus waiting for a customer to place an order. Cons, it can be difficult without a CRM. The CRM itself needs to have a strong process and sales needs to be very engaged. They need to be regularly updating. It only works for a certain business model and bias still exists, right? You have a sales team that's deciding the dates where they think these are gonna close and the probabilities that they're gonna close. And in our next video, we're gonna show you an example of how this works. I know it can be a little difficult to conceptualize. Again, summary, this works for certain business models. It's very CRM dependent, but it, but it can be good. A quick note just on for our SaaS friends, um, you know, revenue is largely driven by recurring sales to an existing customer base. Plus you have some new subscribers and then you've got a little churn of your existing subscribers. There's multiple methods that you can use and they're not that dissimilar from what we talked about that they can actually apply to SaaS. So you, you might use your historical trending. You know how many customers are regularly purchasing on your monthly recurring revenue you know how many of those are churn and your sales team can give you uh, an estimate on how many new customers you'll have. Um, I just wanted to call this out because these models will look a little bit different than you know manufacturing business or healthcare, insurance, financial services, all these others. So that's a wrap. This is not an exhaustive list. You can forecast it a million different ways. You combine methods or you can create new ones. Um, and again, it really depends on your business your resources you have, the skill sets within your company, how much you're willing to spend, and how important the accuracy of your forecast is. And your homework here would be to start to play with these methods in a simple way, right? And our next video is gonna have some examples in Excel which will help you. But think about what will work best for your business. Start to use some of these with your actual data playing around. And like I said, we'll have some ways to, to do this in, in our next video. So that's it, that's a wrap. If you have questions, feel free to drop them in the comments, send us a note, be sure to like this video, subscribe to our newsletter, and if you have any questions or comments, as always,